Um, I think he'll be given five minutes for the presentation. Again, please introduce yourself uh, and mention any re relevant conflict. Um, I think we'll start with uh, Dr. Todd Green um, and to be followed by Dr. Stephen Tillis. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Todd Green. I joined DBV Technologies as Vice President Medical Affairs for North America in 2017 and continue my appointment as Clinical Associate Professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. To ICER and CTAF, we appreciate the opportunity to share a few words with you today and for the review team's willingness to review and analyze the evidence. We agree in multiple areas. First, ICER highlights the significant burden that food allergies have on patients, their families, their caregivers, and society. Peanut allergy is a potentially life-threatening illness, and it does not discriminate. All racial, ethnic, gender, and socioeconomic categories are affected. We applaud ICER's commitment to highlighting innovation that reduces care disparity. We also agree with ICER on the importance of patient safety, as safety, tolerability, and practicality are key considerations for any potential therapy, particularly those involving children. Finally, while both AR101 and Viaskin Peanut have shown statistically significant differences versus placebo in desensitizing peanut allergic patients, in its final evidence report, ICER acknowledges the distinct approach that Viaskin Peanut Epicutaneous Immunotherapy, or EPIT, with a daily dose of approximately one one-thousandth of one peanut kernel administered to the immune system through the skin. There are, however, other points of disagreement that are of importance for peanut allergic patients as well as for the panel today. Last week, ICER notified DBV that, quote, based on a recent systematic review published in The Lancet on oral immunotherapy by Chu et al., we have decided to revise our evidence ratings for both AR101 and Viaskin Peanut from comparable or better to promising but inconclusive. The systematic review concluded, quote, in patients with peanut allergy, high certainty evidence shows that available peanut oral immunotherapy regimens considerably increase allergic and anaphylactic reactions over avoidance or placebo, despite effectively inducing desensitization. ICER states that the publication, quote, increases our baseline uncertainty about the benefits of treatment. DBV Technologies would like to point out that Viaskin peanut clinical trials are not included in this analysis. And so we are unclear why this publication is used as a rationale for revising the assessment. In an accompanying commentary on the study, Roberts and Angier state that, quote, EPID has a better safety profile than oral immunotherapy, which some patients might find more acceptable. ICER has chosen to inappropriately group EPID and OIT together here, despite mechanistic data suggesting that there are important fundamental differences in these two approaches to the immune system. Further, the clinical trials of AR101 and Viaskin Peanut were designed with unique protocols using different endpoints based on double-blind placebo-controlled food challenges which were adjudicated quite differently. Safety assessments were also not uniform between the two trials. In addition for its model, due to the early timing of this review, ICER is not able to use peanut allergy patient-reported outcomes, a primary model driver. To address the evidence gaps, ICER informs its model with food allergy analog evidence and its own estimates of patient benefit from successful treatment. ICER acknowledges the limitation of using these analog data, but it makes no adjustments, despite literature that suggests peanut allergy patients have lower quality of life than food allergy patients that are not allergic to peanut. In closing, there are several key considerations that we feel the panel should evaluate before voting today. By conducting this review far in advance of any potential FDA approval, ICER places this panel in a challenging position. You will be asked to assess the net health benefit of potential interventions before the FDA or any formal FDA advisory committee of allergy experts has done so. You will be asked to validate the ICER rating change on Viaskin Peanut without any new supporting evidence. Further, the panel will be asked to consider value assessments based on analogs and premature assignments of treatment benefit and disutilities and then make direct comparisons of the two potential interventions that cannot currently be compared. Drawing any comparative conclusions at this stage is scientifically and clinically flawed. 
Finally, DBV believes it is simply too early to evaluate investigational treatments for peanut allergy, as it is our position that the cost effectiveness of Viaskin peanut can only be meaningfully assessed after peanut allergy patient reported quality of life data are available and analyzed with reliable approaches to calculate associated health state utility. This panel has an important responsibility to pediatric peanut allergy patients today, as their votes could ultimately influence access to these potential treatments. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Tellis. Thanks. I'm Dr. Steve Tillis, Senior Director of Medical Affairs at Immune Therapeutics. I'm also a board certified allergist and immunologist and recent past president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. For the past 20 years of clinical practice, I've heard one question from patients and their families When will an approved treatment be available? Until now, all I could do is share their sadness and frustration at the lack of any approved options. Avoiding peanuts in everyday life is not an easy prescription. Accidental exposures are inevitable. One in four children with peanut allergy will experience an allergic reaction that requires a visit to the emergency room each year. Allergy management becomes more than just avoiding peanuts. It's avoiding summer camp, birthday parties, eating out, and sleepovers. Avoidance um, is a life defined by fear and anxiety for millions of children and their families. Based on the results of the only successful phase three development program, AR101, AR101 a first of its kind investigational oral immunotherapy, has the potential to transform the lives of these children and their families. Immunotherapy, including allergy shots, has been the backbone of allergy practice for more than 40 years. Immunotherapy intentionally evokes an allergic response in the short term in order to achieve a long-term desensitization, which allows exposure to the allergen without symptoms. And not every patient will experience an allergic reaction. To that end, I would like to uh, clear up one important fact. The first year safety profile of AR101, including systemic reactions in 14% of patients, was exactly as anticipated and in line with other types of effective allergen immunotherapy. For example, 2% of patients treated for pollen allergy and 15% of patients treated for bee sting allergy experience these reactions. And up to 50% of these reactions occur outside the physician's office. And the amount of protection matters. The median quantity of uh, peanuts that provokes allergic reactions in the real world is 125 milligrams, or about one half of one peanut kernel. With that in mind, in Palisade and Artemis, part of the largest and only successful phase three peanut allergy development program, patients treated with AR101 went from being able to tolerate 1 30th of a peanut on average to being able to tolerate three or four peanuts on average, a 100-fold increase. Therefore, AR101 provides an ample buffer for real-world accidental exposures. Beyond efficacy, I'd like to focus on the safety profile of AR101, which was grossly mischaracterized in the Lancet meta-analysis. The article presents a sensationalized apples and oranges comparison, including assumptions that do not take either a holistic or realistic view of peanut allergy management. It should not influence or change ICER's analysis for several reasons. First, it erroneously concludes that AR101 causes more anaphylaxis than it pre prevents, while completely omitting the patient's perspective. Second, systemic reactions experienced during the first year of AR101 treatment are fundamentally different from real-world real anaphylaxis due to accidental ingestion of peanut. Additionally, the rate of allergic reactions with AR101 improves after the first year of treatment. Specifically, our longer-term ARC-004 data submitted to ICER show continued desensitization and resulted in improved safety and immunomodulation. Finally, uh, patients enrolled in our trials were highly allergic and prone to systemic reactions. For example, 6.5 of placebo-treated patients required epinephrine treatment at some point during the, the Palisade trial. Make no mistake, AR101 represents a new form of allergen immunotherapy that requires allergists to receive additional training. But allergists already know how to safely manage anticipated reactions, including training patients how to manage symptoms if they occur outside the allergist's office. 
as with other forms of effective allergen immunotherapy, reactions during treatment with AR101 are anticipated and dissipate over time, consistent with continued immunomodulation. In fact, disease modification uh, occurs with other forms of effective allergen immunotherapy after continuous treatment for three to five years. Yet another point that the Lancet piece does not consider. I cannot stress enough that the allergic reactions encountered in the first 12 months of treatment with AR101 should not be extrapolated forward. The value of addressing the unmet need of peanut allergy far exceeds theoretical discussions of cost effectiveness. For example, a recent study found that 40% of teens believe they have a high likelihood and some believe a certainty of dying from an accidental exposure to peanuts. We are at the precipice of a new day in treatment. Uh, as immune prepares for the potential approval of AR101, I look forward to the day when allergists can offer approved oral immunotherapy to their patients. Thank you. Thank you. I think our panel would like to hear uh, maybe a response from ICER or any the other uh, panelists. Sure. Um, I, I just wanted to speak to the change in the evidence rating because it's at least a little unusual for us to do that uh, so late in the game uh, and understand how the meta-analysis did and did not play into that. And what I would say to all of you is that you can imagine, given the evidence that was out there, looking at rates of epinephrine use, for instance, or serious adverse events, um, that we might have been right on the edge of including the possibility of harm or not including the possibility of harm uh, prior to that systematic review and came down on one side of that. And in part, that was because our sense of the priors was that immunotherapy in general in the allergy world was viewed as safe. Um, and that meta-analysis made us less certain of the overall safety in this space for peanut allergy immunotherapy. Um, I'd, I'd ask if uh, you have access to um, the evidence summary piece. I'm just asking you to pull that out so you can look at the usual uh, ICER matrix that we use, which is figure one. It's probably the only thing with multiple colors in it. <laughs> I've seen it. And I just ask you to look at that to see what the difference is between the C-plus rating that we initially had and the PI rating. And you can see that the entire difference there is the possibility of a slight harm, net harm from a therapy that we hadn't assumed with the C plus rating. And later on, when we get to the point of your voting, you all will get a chance to decide whether you think the possibility of net harm that we included in those ratings is reasonable, or whether really we should have assumed no possibility of net harm given the data. And that's what you all will be asked to do. But I just want you to realize how similar the C plus and PI ratings are. Thank you. Okay, at this point we'll go for a few questions from the panel. Uh, Jeff, uh, Elizabeth, and Kim. Thanks, I was trying to wrap my head around this thing, looking at all the things that have been out. The, so fundamentally what I'm hearing is there's a different uh, adver there's a different anaphylaxis, there's a different allergic reaction than just the random one that occurs from peanut exposure during this treatment. Because if the goal is to avoid allergic reactions, I'm looking at the follow-on Artemis, I'm looking at the original studies, they're six times more likely to have an allergic reaction on treatment than off of treatment, and yet you're desensitized. And so what I'm asking myself is, okay, I take a little peanut every day, I'm more likely to have a reaction, but I'm kind of less sensitized. Where's the trade-off? And what you're telling me is that with other treatments over time, that improves. Do we have data on it for these drugs yet? Um, yes. Okay. But only through 18 months. Uh, so from 12 to 18 months, the, uh, the number, all of the, the adverse events associated with the treatment go down, but also um, the exposures to peanut in the real world go down. Um, it's limited data, but that's, that's the data that, that we have. Um, and, and it's not surprising. I mean, I think this is very complicated. I, I, I completely sympathize with, with the panel's uh, struggles with this. I mean, we, we do this for a living. And, and I completely agree with uh, my friend Todd that um, 
this is premature. I mean, we, we you know, this uh, uh, desensitization is, a, is at least a three-year process, and, and so allergic reactions are expected. They're what allergists do for a living. People in the front lines of allergy practice, that's how they, that's how they make their living, and they're, they're very good at it. Um, it, it. It gets really confusing because we've, um, the, the study, um, the pivotal trial, which was done, as you would guess, uh, in conjunction with the FDA's advice, had exactly what it expected from adverse event profile. And the efficacy actually exceeded what we expected. So it, it, uh, it, is, it is very frustrating um, to hear the, 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 the concern at the level it is. And we want to do everything we can to be transparent and help people understand it better. And, and so just to follow up on that, I presume then there's planned, uh, I guess it would be uh, phase four trials to look at quality of life and look oh, at absolutely. reduction of adverse reactions? Absolutely, yes, and as well as the, um, what's, uh, uh, there's uh, these funny names, ARC-004 was, I mean, Palisade was ARC-003, and then the, the open label extension was, or I'm sorry, the, the uh, um, open label um, stratification that I mentioned, it was called ARC-004. All of the, uh, the program ends up in this study called ARC-008, which has no endpoint at this point, and so we have a lot of patients, there's, to, uh, there's 1,100 patients in the program, um, and so there's, there's just a lot of data yet to be analyzed and, and yet to be collected because of time. Um, so we were faced with a 12-month pivotal trial that uh, hit every single endpoint that we had hoped. Um, and so we we're very pleased with that. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that um, in my experience in 23 years in practice, looking at these parents, I was going to say mothers, but that sounds, that sounds inappropriate, but it's, it's usually that. <laughs> Um, when they come back and have had an allergic reaction somewhere, it's usually at a birthday party or, you know, a restaurant or some place that is not, it's just sort of out of left field and it completely takes them back. It, it harms their, um, it's like, you know, a, a traumatic event. Um, with uh, oral immunotherapy, the reactions tend to happen in the, in the immediate aftermath of the dosing. Um, so as, as most allergic reactions when you're taking a large dose of the allergen. So, so it's a time that's anticipated. It's a, typically uh, they take the, the dose on a full stomach at, at dinner um, and then lay low for a couple of hours. So if there is a reaction, um, it just happens. The, la the final point I want to make is systemic reactions are on a five-point scale, okay? So grade one is a couple of hives, three or four hives on your belly, and you may take... Uh, Diphenhydramine or Benadryl or something, and, and um, that counts. And, and the Lancet article counts that as anaphylaxis. And I'm sorry, um, that that isn't isn't uh, accurate. The FDA, in our discussions with the FDA, defines anaphylaxis as grade three or above. The Palisade study had one patient that had a grade three reaction. The Artemis study, which is the European pivotal trial, had zero. So in terms of severity, um, there's not even a, uh, it, it, it's a dramatic attenuation of symptoms. Well, thank you. I think um, we'll have to move on. I want to thank our uh, uh, speakers. Um, and we'll now have our public commentators come to the table. So thank you, Dr. Tillerson Green. And I'm not, let's see, we have five, I believe. So maybe we'll have them come up one at a time. Or I don't know if we have no, enough space for fantastic. all five. No, I mean, it's still fantastic. <coughs> okay, so maybe we'll begin um, with Charmaine Basically Anderson. You, just said. Have, you can take a seat, um, followed by um, Kenny Mendez. So, um, please, again, when you introduce yourself, uh, let us know if you have any potential conflicts of interest. Good morning, everyone. I'm Charmaine Anderson. I'm the Director of Advocacy for Allergy and Asthma Network. And I'm here um, in the absence of our CEO, Tanya Wenders. Um, so again, thank you all for the time to be here. Um, I will state there are no personal conflicts that our organization has. Uh, so again, I'm the Director of Advocacy for Allergy and Asthma Network. We are a national nonprofit dedicated to ending needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions. Since 1985, we have worked to build patient-centered collaborative care teams throughout the U.S. to serve the 60-plus million Americans living with these conditions. 
Today, however, I'm here specifically on behalf of the three to four million Americans living with a peanut allergy. And as you know, the prevalence and burden is growing, and these patients live in constant fear of accidental exposure. And I'll just add a personal note that I, too, am asthmatic. I have children who are asthmatic, but I do have one child, a teenager, in college with a peanut allergy, so the fear is real. Um, it, in this segment that accounts for the majority of the $56 billion per year in direct and indirect costs based on the literature. But these are not nameless, faceless statistics. These are real people with families, hopes, dreams, and fears. I'm here to tell their story and to challenge this panel to determine if ICER's report adequately represents the true definition of value. And if I can get this right, I'm going to show you guys some of our patients. Here we go. So first, let's meet Allie from Philadelphia. Allie's a 34-year-old young professional who lives with multiple food allergies, including peanut. She is beautiful, intelligent, and brave. She has taught elementary school abroad and stateside. She has written a blog about her challenges living with life-threatening allergies for the past 10 years. Yet every day, at every meal, she must remain hypervigilant to avoid a life-threatening reaction. She takes significant steps to ensure her safety, including skipping meals when dining out and translating chef cards in many different languages. Even so, each year she averages at least two to three accidental exposures resulting in a reaction. Next, I would like to share the story of Thomas from New York City. Thomas is a hardworking father of two and husband. He suffered every parent's nightmare in 2014. When his three-year-old son Elijah, pictured here, died from a severe life-threatening allergy while at preschool. Even though Thomas and his wife took great strides in making sure his child care providers were aware of Elijah's food allergy and prepared to administer epinephrine, an accidental exposure occurred, and within minutes this man's world was turned upside down. His family will never be the same. Avoidance alone is simply not enough. As the literature reflects, at least 30% of patients experience accidental exposure each year and must go unreported. Finally, I'm compelled to share Carson's story. Carson, from the outside looking in, is a vibrant 14-year-old preparing for her first days as a high school volleyball player outside of Nashville, Tennessee. The truth is, she lives with a constant level of fear and anxiety. Fear that the next bite of pizza may be the one to land her in the ER. Anxiety that her friends may have to administer epinephrine simply to save her life. Fear that her mother will never see her grow into the confident, successful woman, wife, and mother Carson longs to be. You see, Carson is the daughter of Tanya Winders, president and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network. And she is one of the many reasons our organization is represented here today and remains engaged in this ICER review process. While ICER states these treatments result in a small net benefit, patients would beg to differ. How do you put a price tag on this added quality of life, not only for the patients who live each day with this allergy, but also for those who love them so dearly? Based on this and former comments, we implore ICER to reconsider its value framework. ICER's process should capture not only the payer, but also the true societal perspective more effectively. Furthermore, the report acknowledges the disease complexity and variability of data considered. However, it does not adequately address these issues, nor does it reflect the concerns of stakeholders voiced in the public comments. Allergy and Asthma Network respectfully asks ICER and the panel to consider patient reported outcomes like reducing caregiver burden and missed school days and work days, rather than simply reducing side effects, ER visits, hospitalizations, or quality-adjusted life years. We also believe patients deserve better options. Avoidance alone simply is not enough. We will continue to advocate for appropriate use of innovative treatments and believe that when the right treatment is selected for the right patient at the right time, it inevitably provides a financial benefit to the healthcare system and individual patients. Significant scientific advancements in peanut allergy diagnosis and treatment are promising. Patients like Allie, Elijah, Carson, and Carson are depending on you 
to ensure this innovation actually reaches the community it can help the most. Innovation right. without Have access to. only breeds frustration. Thank you for the integral role you serve today, and thank you for helping us to end needless death and suffering due to peanut allergy. Thank you for your comments. Um, we'll move on uh, to uh, Kenneth Mendez. Thank you. you uh, I guess I've already been introduced, but I also want to say, in addition to speaking on behalf of the allergy and asthma community, I'm also here as a parent of three sons, two of whom have uh, food allergies. And um, my youngest, Theo, by the time he was two years old, had visited the emergency room twice with anaphylaxis. He couldn't eat peanuts, beef, dairy, uh, eggs, or milk. Um, and then my middle son, Will, has life-threatening peanut allergies. Um, to, and allergies to legumes. Theo was lucky, he was one of that 15 to 20 percent. He outgrew the allergies by the time he was five years old. Um, he's now 22 and just graduated from college last week. Will's 24, but he still has these allergies and carries an epinephrine, uh, epinephrine with him. So that's some of where my perspective is coming from in this. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all here, uh, Steve and Celia in particular, for helping through this. Um, I think you've heard the patient stories and you'll hear more of them, but what I'd like to do is focus on what this group will do here today, all, all of you, since I've been through this one, once before, and the process and what you'll do at the end of this exercise with the vote. Because what you do is really important, cost is really important in terms of what ICER does, but we're not here to compare the two therapies. We've already heard that that's not what this exercise is about. There are no prices on these therapies therapies, um, and you can't compare the two therapies, uh, and, and it said that in, in, the, uh, in the study. And then when you look at oral immunotherapy, there are no meaningful clinical trials, so we're not looking at that either. So I think the most important thing here is the focus on the outcomes, and I've said this already, um, on the health benefits, and most importantly, the con contextual considerations, which ICER has done a great job of fleshing out in the report, and I'd say that... Um, the contextual considerations are the most important part of the analysis. If you look at whether you agree with qualities or not, what this analysis really shows is the significant health benefits provided by these two therapies. If you look at the modified societal analysis in the report, it ranges between 30 to 70 percent, this is CEL math here, uh, improvement in value. So it's going from 88,000 down to 27,000 when you look at the modified societal impact or 216,000 down to 155,000. So that, in terms of the analysis that ICER has done, really reflects the impact of peanut allergies and these therapies on um, you know, the ICER analysis and what it has to do with patients. Um, ICER also in its report clearly states the benefits of these to caregivers in addition to the youth pa uh, patients. And then clearly the research I presented earlier demonstrated the caregiver burden, some of the other uh, societal impacts. Another thing that's embedded in the ISA report are the context contextual considerations about the underserved and how they disproportionately, uh, peanut allergies disproportionately affect the underserved. So when you get to the questions for deliberation and voting, because that's really why you're here, let me just run, this, run through this from a societal perspective, from the patient per perspective. So when you look at question one, I'd say yes on AR 101 versus strict avoidance. Question two, yes on Viaskin versus strict avoidance. Question three, there's no evidence to distinguish between the two since that's not what this exercise is about. Question four, there's no oral immunotherapy um, and, and enough meaningful clinical trial data to look at. So I'd, I'd say a no on that. As you get to the benefits and contextual considerations, question five for Viaskin, I'd say yes on A through E as you look through this, and F because it's a first of a, if it's kind therapy. Question six for AR101, yes on A, a through E and F um, and because it's a first of its kind therapy. So. Uh, question seven from Viaskin, yes on A, but there's not enough information for B through D. And then question eight, AR 101, yes on A, but not enough in questions B through D. So that's where you guys are going to land today. There will be a final report that's printed from how you vote. And I'm trying to encourage you here. We've heard about the modeling, but listen to the patient perspective. 
because how you vote matters, and it's clear the contextual considerations and the health benefits are really most important in this exercise for these first-of-kind therapies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, next, we'll hear from Nuri Hong. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I'm going to echo some of Kenny's comments and some of the other comments that have been made, but I'll, I'll really try to uh, convey a message here to really just articulate the patient perspective. And I'm making a, a call of action or a plea to this group to really think about all the totality of evidence and feedback that we have available to make the best decision and uh, determination of value and how we think about access policies. Um, we really do appreciate ICER's uh, significant involvement to include the patient community and to have an opportunity to provide our vo voice throughout this process. Uh, that, that's very meaningful to us, and we, we fully recognize that, you know, that opportunity. Um, having said that, we, we had an interesting discussion today about the quality of the health economic analysis and the assessment, the data, the quality of the data, uh, additional pieces of information that we're, we're, we would like to see to make a more accurate assessment. And I think that's the right discussion to have because there are missing pieces of information that we would like to see and that would make us more informed. And to Kenny's point, I think when we lack that data to make a quantitative-based decision, we really encourage everyone to think about the patient perspective. And that would be important, I believe, in any case, even with perfect data. But in this case especially, we ask everyone to, to take all considerations into account. Kenny already mentioned some of the societal considerations, so I won't go through all of those again. But I do want to mention, this is a life-threatening disease. We heard that the experience is one of fear, frustration, and uncertainty. And the way that patients think about protecting themselves is finding a path towards desensitization. That fear, frustration, and uncertainty gets relieved with desensitization and some added protection. And to Matt's earlier point, that is not linear. The amount of desensitization does not necessarily translate into the improvement in the quality of life. And that's just a very important distinction that we want to communicate so everyone understands that. You've heard patients are obviously desperate for treatment. And while we don't have perfect data for all, all of the information that we're looking for, we do have a lot of experience and patient experience from in-office OIT that's currently practiced today. And I know that there are significant improvements we want to make to that practice. That is not available for everyone, and it is not a, a, an alternative treatment to these products, given the limited uh, availability. But there is incredible insight that we can glean from that, including the discussion we just had around the Lancet article and the, the rate of reactions when on therapy versus not. And I think that is a fundamental area of confusion that we would like to clarify. The reported information from that meta-analysis was not surprising to the food allergy community. Patients know that in terms of the, if you ingest antigen, you will have a greater likelihood of a reaction. And what we are imploring physicians and patients to do is have an informed discussion around what that trade-off in that dosing regimen and protocol entail, versus what that end benefit may be, and how that benefit may accrue over the rest of your lifetime in terms of improved quality of life and protection. And that's the discussion that patients are having with their physicians when they're seeking this option. It is not a straight comparison of rates, because that really misses the nuance of those reactions. And there's a completely different feeling when you are having a reaction in an office or under a controlled setting with EpiPen ready versus an accidental exposure. And that difference is meaningful. And what we should be asking ourselves is, why do patients put themselves through that? How profound is the unmet need and the benefit of even moderate desensitization that you have patients lining up out of physician's offices trying to get access to this type of therapy? And I think if we really think about how to answer that question with input from the patient community, we can make a much more informed decision of what is a fair and reasonable access policy and a judgment of value for these therapies. Um, and I, would, I, I really encourage us to listen to those testimonials and to hear that feedback and to really understand how patients are making that trade-off. I can assure you, the folks, the patients that we have met 
and have undergone immunotherapy and did not react well, they are not continuing to expose themselves to those harms. They discontinue. They do not see the benefit. But for everyone else, there is profound unmet need that's being resolved by these therapies. Thank you. And thank you for your comments. Um, our next public commentator will be uh, Kari Nadeau. Thank you so much for having the public speak today. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm a professor at Stanford. I'm a pediatrician. I'm also a researcher, and I've been practicing as a board-certified allergist for over 20 years. I've, uh, with my team, treated over 3,000 patients in immunotherapy for food allergy. And in addition, I have, uh, with my team, over 100 peer-reviewed papers in this area specifically. So I'm excited to be able to talk today. Importantly is I think um, I'd like to make three points. Number one, I understand that the CHU study was sort of the last thing on people's mind and that that grade was changed because of it. But it is essentially flawed. They cherry-picked the studies that they used for their meta-analysis. They did not incorporate long-term studies. The long-term studies that are published, as well as those that I recently spoke at in a European meeting in Lisbon last week, for which the data is not published yet, we have three years of long-term data in a randomized controlled NIH-funded study that's placebo-controlled we will have quality of life studies. We show in that study that there were much less accidental ingestions over time and that safety improved. So that data is not published yet, but I am allowed to talk about it today. In addition, the CHU study is flawed in terms of the adverse events. They were not all defined the same. And so when we compare apples to apples, it's appropriate to use the same definitions, and that was not the case in the CHU at all study. So I think it would be premature to grade this type of immunotherapy based on this one most recent study. What Dr. Tillis and what Dr. Green have mentioned, as well as I'm sure my other colleagues would agree that are practicing allergists, is that this is what we're trained to do. We're licensed to be able to give allergen immunotherapy. It's been going on for over 100 years. So that the immunotherapy that you have the chance to be able to make decisions about today is an important one to put in the context of a well-trained medical staff with nurses, excuse me, with medical physicians that know how to give immunotherapy. The chances of having a reaction are there. We've been dealing with it as a specialty, and we're trained to be able to handle that. Allergic reactions happen within two hours of the ingestion. Parents and patients are trained, as well as medical facilities. So these are all data that we know, we know well, and that we're willing to deal with and manage, because in the end, the benefit is huge for patients. Lastly, I'd like to implore that, from what I understand from the ICER committee and what you've looked at before for other drugs, for example, dupilumab with atopic dermatitis, giving specific grades for that scenario, I would like to be able to think about how your decision today is put into the context of other allergy drugs that you've approved in the past. And if there's not enough data, which is what Dr. Green as well as I agree, that this would be premature to be able to give it a grade that's negative or non-beneficial without having all the data in hand. Lastly, the quality of life studies, to be able to say that they were poor and not uh, ready to be able to analyze. In the CHU et al. article, there's only two quality of life studies that were analyzed there. There's over 13, and of those, seven of them were placebo-controlled. And when you look at meta-analysis that was done by other groups, not the CHU et al. group, Nermatov et al., the IACI guidelines, the European, a global community of experts have analyzed this data and have looked at the efficacy compared to safety. And if ICER comes out with a D grade, that would be in complete contradiction of these well-known expert panels that have already rendered guidelines that are published. And so I think we just need to be very careful before decisions are made that could potentially be premature, given the data that's out there and given the data that will be coming in the future. So thank you. And I want to make sure there's time enough to have you hear from patients and families. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Our last public commenter 
Uh, it will be Tessa Grosso. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to have my voice heard. I also would like to thank those of you who have advocated for us, the patients. I am 16 and one of the first to go through OIT. It has been the most important, valuable, and empowering experience in my life. I'm here to ensure that your value assessment tools capture a real person. I am not a statistic and I am no longer defined by an allergy. My allergy caused isolation, depression, anxiety, and fear for myself and everyone close to me. Thankfully, I was privileged to live close to Stanford and lucky to have a mom who searched tirelessly for a solution beyond avoidance. So in my three minutes, I wanted to add a few points to, to support your deliberations. Number one, desensitization is valuable. Patients like me don't want to eat a PB&J, but we do want to sit with other kids at lunch. Something so simple is a privilege that you cannot understand unless you have walked in our shoes. Number two, controlled anticipated use of epinephrine in a study is really different than an unexpected attack at school or with a friend. As Dr. Gupta implied, families can be coached to understand this. Number three, I can't comment on the health economic assessment tools you are applying, but I can say emphatically that the quality of life benefits are transformative. They are a substantial net benefit. I am the data and I know many other patients who would say the same. Please know that we stand ready to make our experience and successes available to all of you. Undergoing therapy is a, is a choice that should be available, accessible, and affordable for every single family. I want to implore you on behalf of all the patients who aren't here to recognize the incredible value, saving my life, giving me a new life. Every child deserves this. We have fought to advance the first therapies for food allergy. Patients across the country are watching now. Your votes will profoundly influence access. Please include our voices. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comment, and thanks again to all the public commenters. Um, at this point, we'll ask Celia to give us lunch instructions. <laughs> 